The Valley Lab Laparoscopic Smoke Evacuation System is designed to improve visualization in your laparoscopic procedures by efficiently removing and filtering surgical smoke. The device evacuates and filters surgical smoke from the peritoneal cavity. It's easy to set up, doesn't require the suction of built-up smoke, and won't cause disruption to pneumoperitoneum. Connect the long, thin tubing to a free port on the wall suction canister or compatible suction unit outside the sterile field. Set the suction regulator between 100 and 400 millimeters of mercury. When selecting a port, choose a trocar that will provide sustained, maximized airflow, or one with a larger diameter than the instrument. Avoid ports where the instrument is rarely removed or occupies maximum trocar space. Ideally, the selected trocar will be away from the insufflation port to allow for cross-ventilation. Connect the shorter tubing to the lure lock on the trocar, and then switch the trocar valve to the open position. There are two options for securing the device to the drape. Option one is to clip the device to the folded drape. Be sure to allow slack for movement of the drape. Option two is to pull the drape through the opening in the device and then secure using a surgical clamp. As with option one, be sure to allow slack for movement of the drape. To get an idea of how the device impacts gas flow levels on your insufflator, start with the device set to zero. Now turn the dial of the Valley Lab laparoscopic smoke evacuation system to your intended setting. The device is designed to evacuate smoke at a maximum rate of 14 liters per minute. As you increase the rate of smoke evacuation, you may notice the insufflator flow rate increasing. It is replacing the gas that is flowing out through the smoke evacuator while maintaining the set pressure. This is normal, and the system is designed to be used without the loss of pneumoperitoneum. The device will maintain pneumoperitoneum even at max settings. However, you may consider lower settings in certain instances to reduce the gas output from the insufflator. Adjust the suction levels to best suit the needs of your procedure. Once set, the smoke will be continuously evacuated through an OLPA filter in the device body. Any fluids from condensation will also be collected and will not drip on the floor. At the end of the procedure, simply disconnect and dispose of the device appropriately. Improve visualization. Reduce the risk of surgical smoke. The Valley Lab Laparoscopic Smoke Evacuation System We are back now with the new session. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, Osman. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey. Hey. Hi. Osim. Hey. Hi, guys. I can hear yeah. everyone. Yeah, fine. Are we going to start now or are we on? Uh, are we live? I... Mahir, we can start. Yes. Uh, this session, uh, we will talk about minimally invasive surgery uh, during COVID 19 pandemic. And uh, let me share my screen and I will show you. Hi, Kamal. It's nice to see Hello. you. Hello, my nice to see you too. Hello, Hi. Ashwagandha. Nice to see you. Let me, let me share my screen and um, I will, okay, now I would like to introduce my colleague, uh, this one. I would like to introduce my colleague. Uh, Professor Sardar Nayam, who is from Bangladesh, and I will uh, chair this session with him. We have three distinguished speakers, and all of you know uh, Asim Sabir, uh, who is actually a great organizer of this uh, Congress. Uh, 
and he is working on National University Hospital in Singapore, and he is mainly uh, doing uh, bariatric and metabolic surgery as well as upper gastrointestinal surgery and advanced uh, uh, endoscopy and laparoscopic surgery. And he is going to give some information regarding uh, changes uh, during COVID-19 and ELSA uh, situations at the moment. And second speaker is going to be Kemal Mahawar. He's a good friend of mine. And he's going he's gonna to be uh, talking on bariatric surgery. He's a consultant surgeon and professor in Sunderland uh, in UK. And the last speaker is my good friend, my colleague, and uh, my brother, uh, Professor Cem Khan Parsak from Turkey. He's a professor and head of the Department of Surgery in Chikrova University in Adana, in the south uh, part of Turkey. And uh, I would like to leave a um, uh, microphone to my uh, chair colleague, Professor Nayam, to introduce the first speaker. Nayam. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Mahir. Thank you very much for your introduction. And I also welcome all of you, all the uh, participants and speakers to this session. I I'm taking this opportunity to uh, uh, call upon Dr. Osin Sabir, uh, whom we all know. And he will speak on the ELSA recommendations in general uh, in the COVID era, but we, which, which has become very, very important at the moment the whole world. Asim Sabir, please go on. You have 12 minutes to finish your lecture. And actually, we will give a verbal uh, uh, note at the end of 11 minutes so that you can finish by 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Asim. You. I hope I'm heard well. Uh, welcome to this uh, seminar. And um, I, on behalf of the entire, uh, of uh, all the authors and all the Board of Governors of ELSA, I'm privileged to present the ELSA recommendations for minimally invasive surgery that was published in Surgical Endoscopy. Uh, how this guidelines differs from the rest is because Asia was a little different. We had people from different socioeconomic status and different degree of uh, penetration of the COVID infection. So the infestation was different. So we tried to group together a set of guidelines that could help people both not in during the phase itself and as well as the recovery phase. Uh, when we put up this guidelines, uh, it was very early in the COVID time, so they were tailored to meet the needs of specific countries and their communities. However, the overarching principle was clinical judgment at that point in time, because nobody knew how the PCR tests were going to perform, how the viruses were going to react, why we would have a second wave, third wave, but now we're knowing more. <clears throat> so what we tried to contain in this is from widespread to limited contaminated threat. So in like Singapore, the disease was very contained, whereas in other places, like you can see in India and other places, the disease was very, very widespread at that point in time. So we talked about uh, elective surgery and we talked about emergency surgery. So here's elective surgery. The red bar basically uh, represents uh, the active community spread state and the orange bar is a limited state and whereas the uh, yellow bar is isolated cases. <clears throat> On the x-axis, uh, you would see case selection for cases and screening elective cases. So in the active community spread, there is no other surgery other than onco surgery that's going on and even uh, the emergency surgery is largely curtailed. We will see in the left stripe. Uh, where cap capabilities exist, we recommended swabbing patients preoperatively for elective cases with ARI. Uh, for pneumonia, those with positive travel history and contact history and swabbing all patients with elective surgery in areas where poor uh, contact tracings were available. In lim limited community spread, uh, the swabbings will largely remain the same. However, uh, there was allowance to perform oncology and trauma services. And in an isolated state, what we did is uh, we basically said, proceed with elective surgery, consider delaying non-urgent surgeries uh, like elective cholecystectomies, uh, and to a certain degree in Asia, bariatric surgery was delayed. When we looked at the emergency loads in active uh, community spread, uh, non-surgical management was preferred, uh, and this continued into the limited uh, community spread state, and then in the isolated, you go back to normal emergency management. 
screening again everybody was presumed to be high till the isolated case uh, context and we recommended that people actually go through uh, testing whatever facilities they had uh, the surgeons and the community medical fraternity was advised to wear PPE masks uh, with uh, N95 and as we saw earlier uh, and later we would see from Mahi's uh, side that they were all supposed to wear uh, full down PPEs <clears throat> and this will still go on till isolated case stays uh, as we can see as per normal. Now when we go into real opening strategies where this active community spread you gradually bring in things uh, because the systems are overwhelmed they still need of ICU high dependency bed uh, we still recommend please do not restart normal services in the limited step you can start full oncology trauma and obstetrics and elective services can slowly start when there's isolated case spread you restart day surgery as back and start short case study uh, case uh, operations uh, whereas in the blue horizon you start back to normal what we recommended is uh, patients uh, give informed consent knowing when they go through surgery whether that's an elective surgery or emergency surgery that they have a potential risk of landing up with a COVID infection uh, and if they do, their outcomes cannot be as smooth as they might have expected them. Uh, avoid late night surgeries if uh, they can. Uh, more skilled people. So if you have senior residents in your team, they can do part of the operation, but it's not good to leave the entire operation to them. Uh, minimize the number of people in the staff. And uh, based on our gas exchange rates in the OR, we would require about five minutes for the viral count to go down to zero. So we, we recommended anywhere between five to 10 minutes for be, uh, before in after intubation and uh, after extubation to basically stay out uh, of the theater. Uh, trainees uh, participation, uh, especially the junior ones best avoided. Uh, if there are facilities available for negative pressure uh, environment, uh, that would be good. If not, then a separate complex where it can be used to operate on these COVID positive patients. The PPE, as I said, included an N95 mask, an impervious gown, double gloves, a shield or goggles, uh, no preventive evidence of uh, PARP over the PPE. PPE used during transport should not be the same as worn during the other procedures. So if you're gonna send your patient out between patients, you've got to change them. Uh, team change is required for prolonged full PPE services. Uh, like doing a cardiac bypass or Ivor Lewis esophagectomy or McEwen's, uh, please, uh, you might want to swap teams because fatigue sets in early. Um, we saw a video by Medtronic just now. There are many companies apart from Medtronic, uh, like Urbe uh, and others, who actually have smoke evacuators. They've been around for a long time, and we strongly recommend they use, especially in COVID time, uh, because they're HEPA filter compliant and you can remove. Uh, a lot of plume. Um, I feel that since I am wearing mask, I am getting lesser flus now. I'm better off uh, um, and most probably not coughing so much because I'm not sucking plume anymore. Uh, the suction machines are doing a better job now. Effective communication between yourself and the anesthetist, adequate uh, disposal of waste that is generated and continued education uh, was some of the key points that we stressed in these guidelines. As far as TOCAS were concerned, we said that the individualized the approach and timing of surgery by balancing the risk of disease progression with the risk of surgery and aerosolization. So if you're going to do long-term procedures, long procedures, which will generate a lot of plume, then uh, try and balance the risk, especially in the uh, active state of disease. TOCAS insertions uh, should admit the TOCA. Uh, the skin should actually embrace the TOCA there should not be any air leak. And if there is, then put a purse string uh, around it. Or as uh, Dr. Mahe's team would have shown you, uh, you should put something that is adhesive and the skin and block any uh, drainage through. Disposal chokas should be used because you can use the reusable, but they're very difficult to sterilize and there may be corners uh, where uh, the virus contamination may still persist and may result in uh, un. Uh, unnecessary viral infection. Creating peritoneum, uh, you create peritoneum by the technique that you're most familiar. 
be that open uh, through the use of various needle or through uh, optitrocast, but use what is most familiar with. Use low pressure and low flow to operate on patients. Uh, if you are to convert to open surgery for any reason, like the extraction of specimen, then <coughs> it is best that you suck out all the air from the abdominal cavity, thoracic cavity, uh, and then convert to open uh, and teach safe uh, practices. Most of us do not practice a two-way pneumoperitoneum in supplementation, uh, and it was discouraged during times of COVID infection. Uh, how do you minimize plume? Uh, we recommended that you use minimal energy device, uh, avoid prolonged activation, avoid activation in a pool of blood with tissue. Um, if you're using electrocautery, set your electrocautery at low power, uh, suction frequently to avoid accumulation. And as you can see, most of the succor, the uh, evacuators now are connected to the insufflators. So they automatically read when it's deflating and inflating and will adjust. So that's good. Uh, keep instruments clean of blood and tissues and operating surfaces. So there were at that time in point, a lot of companies had uh, smoke evacuators, but unfortunately there was not enough market supply which could deal with the needs of the market and to other countries in Asia, there were problems basically even uh, bearing the cost of buying these new systems. So there was a DIY solution, which Mahiva and his team put up, is to basically vent and under an under seal sidex, which would then take care of the plume and absorb also the viral load in there. There are electrostatic filters that can be used as well. Instrument care, use disposable instruments where possible because reusable instruments, as I said, for choka. Uh, they may not be cleaned properly and then they lose their life. Uh, they become dull over time as well and they may have damages in them which may carry bacterial load. Surgical drains only if necessary. Uh, we publish these guidelines uh, with the help of the local board of governors in many languages so that they could be translated and they could help the larger communities in their various countries. With that, I come to the end of the ALSA guidelines and recommendations. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, especially thank you very much for keeping uh, the time limit. You were just, just okay. And uh, in this session, probably we're not going to have any uh, question and answer session, isn't it, Mahir? Uh, but still, if any, any quick comment or any question, that will be welcome. And otherwise, it was a very informative lecture from Asim, as usual. And I, I, I will ask Mahir to go for the second lecture. But before that, probably I'll have to let you know that uh, Dr. Parsak will not be available today. Uh, instead of Parsak, Dr. Yalav will speak at the end. So Mahir, go for the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second speaker is Kemal Mahawar, who is actually, as I told you, is a consultant uh, surgeon and a professor of surgery in Sunderland Royal Hospital. And he is an uh, associate editor of the Obesity Surgery. And he's a great uh, surgeon and a great uh, investigator. He has done many contribution to uh, bariatric and metabolic surgery. And uh, I believe today he's gonna give the results of the um, uh, consensus statement, uh, which is carried out for a, a short while ago. And I'm uh, ready, uh, and we are all ready to hear from Kemal what's happening on that side. Hi, Kemal. Mic microphone is on you. Um, hello, my. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me here, and. Uh, Thank you very much for the generous introduction. It is an honor to be amongst you, uh, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. And then um, good morning to, to uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening to people around the world who may be listening to, to this. Uh, I'm uh, Kamal Mahawar. I'm one of the consultant surgeons at Sunderland uh, uh, in, in Northeast in England. 
So I've been asked to present the findings of a consensus statement that we organized on bariatric surgery uh, recently, and I'm going to, to share that with you. So as you will see, this was published in the Obesity Surgery and it included um, a number of highly respectable surgeons from around the world, including you know, Professor Shabir and Professor Osman and, and, and many, many, many others. So um, I'd like to think uh, that it is uh, an authoritative document on this topic. So as we know that bariatric surgery, like, like any other and like many other uh, elective surgeries came to, to, to a grinding halt in most parts of the world in the month of April and May. But by June, in some parts of the world, things were becoming better. Uh, and then we were thinking, you know, we need to now start thinking of performing this surgery because we know that patients who are suffering from obesity, they appear to be at a higher risk of problems with, with, with COVID-19 pandemic as well. So, so, you know, and this pandemic is not going to go anywhere. So if we want to help our patients, we have to help uh, uh, them deal with obesity. At the same time, there were challenges in many parts of the world, uh, particularly in, in countries that have publicly funded healthcare like UK, where obesity is not perceived as a disease and, and bariatric surgery is sometimes accorded a very low priority. So we thought if we set out a clear guidance uh, for professionals, then, then it will also uh, maybe sway funders from around the world to, and, and they will take notice um, of, of this uh, group of patients. And along with that, there were genuine questions in the minds of people because this was soon after the um, Lancet Diabetes and Technology published a consensus statement from a group of multidisciplinary uh, you know, professionals involved in, in bariatric and metabolic surgery, where they issued a number of recommendations regarding safe resumption of bariatric surgery. Uh, and some of their recommendations uh, were uh, like you should prioritize the, the high risk patients and prioritize patients uh, with, with multiple uh, comorbidities. And also then there were questions amongst, in, um, amongst the surgeon's mind, you know, will surgery really be safe? I don't know, will I be harming my patients if I do this surgery? So we thought this is the right topic where there's so much of confusion, experts from around the world should come in and, and come up with a statement uh, which should hopefully guide practice on the ground. And we know that consensus statement does not replace real evidence, but in areas where there is no evidence, consensus building amongst experts is often the only alternative left. And we followed a modified Delphi strategy, which is a recognized tool for developing consensus amongst uh, experts, uh, uh, expert professionals. So what we did, we, we, rec we uh, put together a group of 44 recognized opinion makers in the field from 23 countries. And, and they put together a number of statements and then they voted on them in two rounds. So it was a bit of an elaborate process and people who have taken part, they know that the number of steps to it, between putting together the statements, then getting the wording right, and then, then voting on them. So that, 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 is a, that is a bit of a process. And this is the whole committee. I do not have the, the time, uh, otherwise I would like to mention everybody here by name because without their help and effort, it would not have been possible. And I should also acknowledge the help of Jack Pujols and, and, and Islam Omar, who are uh, trainee surgeons from Netherlands and England respectively, uh, who also helped me with, 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 this, uh, uh, with this exercise. So coming to the key points uh, that I would like to draw your attention to, in amongst general considerations, uh, one thing that was made very clear was that, that a delayed bariatric and metabolic surgery also hinders the, the resolution of obesity and comorbidities and hence should not be just uh, taken as, as an easy option out. And the, the more important thing was that any decision to resume should be made according to the local circumstances. So, so it's not like, you know, surgeons should not feel under any pressure to do it if in their area, the infection rates are high and if they don't feel comfortable to do it. Because we know that with this virus, even within a country, even within a state, some areas may behave differently from, from the others. The, the other important recommendation in this category we made was that people should keep a very close eye on the mobility and mortality of bariatric surgery performed in the initial phase after resumption. And to address that point in particular, 
we launched a further study, which is now called Geneva study, and we'll be, for, we'll be publishing the, the findings of that very soon, because we have recruited thousands of patients from around the world in that study, uh, and we'll be sharing some data with, with everybody soon. It's been submitted, so I can't really disclose much about that study now. It was obvious that we, we, we lay emphasis that hospitals' provisions for PPE should be ensured, because if hospital doesn't have PPE, and if surgeons want to do bariatric surgery, then that really doesn't fit. And if, if a separate hospital or clinic was not available, the recommendation was that bariatric surgery should be carried out in a hospital wing or part, which does not treat patients with COVID-19. And similarly, screening tests, we thought, should be performed in a facility where contact with other patients would be minimized. That takes me nicely on to testing considerations. And then again, you know, the group made a number of, um, uh, of recommendations. It, we said that patients should undergo locally appropriate testing to screen for SARS-CoV-2 infection 24 to 72 hours before BMS. And I have to say, this has been a, a game changer. This is one, something that we are practicing in our unit as well. And we have been doing bariatric surgery since um, middle of July. And, and I dare say, I think we performed close to, to 50, 60 procedures already. Uh, without uh, any uh, uh, COVID infection, to the best of my knowledge. As I said earlier, patients should be screened before the, the, the uh, screen for the symptoms of COVID-19 before arrival into the hospital, uh, and patients' hospital duration should also be as short as possible. So currently, what we are doing in our hospital is patients are coming to hospital on the morning of surgery and then going home the next day, which is a slight change from our protocol before pandemic. So at the moment, we our patients just stay one night in the hospital. In terms of make, making patients aware, we said that patients should, should be aware of the, the, the additional risk of acquiring the SARS-CoV-2 infection and then the implications. So we know from the COVID research collaborators today that it, it carries quite uh, severe and lethal implications. So, so what I'm doing in my own practice is I, I make patients uh, aware of this possibility uh, that they know that the, the risk of acquiring is low, but if they do acquire it, then it could be quite serious for them. And then we also made recommendations with regards to healthcare professionals. I don't have any time to, to go through each of them, but we said that naturally patients, the healthcare professionals who are symptomatic should not be, 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 be involved in healthcare and also they should self-isolate. Then it comes to the important patient selection criteria because this was the confusing bit for many surgeons as to what they should do. So to simplify it, we said the qualifying criteria for surgery should be the same as before the, the pandemic. So there should be no confusion. If you, if you, whatever criteria you followed before the pandemic, just stick to that because you don't want to make, it, make too many changes. Similarly, with regards to the procedure, because there were some noises that, you know, if you should perform a shorter procedure or less complex procedure for everybody. Just again, you know, we said, no, just do whatever you would normally do for an individual patient uh, and do not let the pandemic influence your choice. Quite uh, naturally, we, we expected the comorbidities to be optimized even more so before the surgery in, in, in pandemic times. We also said that complication management should not be delayed because this can be quite quite dangerous. And, and, and as, as I was telling Dr. Naeem, I, I've spent the whole night dealing with an internal hernia following a UNY bypass I performed three years ago. So, so, so these things happen and, and we must not delay these things. Quite significantly, the group said that patients with Poor cardiopulmonary reserves, such as ischemic heart disease and COPD, should be avoided in the, in the initial phase. This was, this was different to the guidelines that were published in Lancet. And similarly, we also said that patients with more than two comorbidities should be avoided in the initial phase. So again, you know, making quite strong recommendations that maybe the sicker patients should be initially avoided. And then we said that the, with regards to endoscopy, the recommendation should be that, that, that whatever you were doing before the pandemic, you just carry on. Same was with regards to approach of surgery because there was some uh, suggestion that laparoscopic surgery should not be performed during the pandemic, but we thought bariatric surgery cannot be performed open anyway. So you, you just, just do it the way you do it, either laparoscopically or, or robotically. Uh, and and we, we thought it would be reasonable for surgeons to allow more time um, for each procedure because you know when you're wearing the masks and all and, and the full, full PPE, it is, it is not always comfortable. We've already heard from Dr. Shabir regarding how to deal with pneumoperitoneum and, 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 and surgical fumes. So I'll not, I'm not going to that, but again, you know, we made some recommendations about how to deal with that too. I'm coming to the last slide in the interest of time. 
with regards to post-operative considerations, I've already touched upon this. We, we, we thought that patients should follow an enhanced recovery to minimize hospital stay. And in the post-operative period, patients should be made aware that any persistent cough or fever should promptly be investigated for COVID-19. Uh, and uh, we also suggested that patients should self-isolate after surgery with family members at home for approximately two weeks. And the, the review that normally most surgeons do within a week should be telephonic uh, rather than face-to-face. -face. And of course, patients should be, be advised to seek urgent medical attention in cases of uh, symptoms suggestive of either complication or a COVID-19 infection. And, and finally, we, we thought telemedicine should replace face-to-face -face consultation as much as possible. In fact, most of my clinics now, general surgical as well as bariatric clinics, are all virtual. And if I, if I can't do the job properly in the virtual clinic, or if I think a patient needs to come, come and see me, then only I book a face-to-face -face clinic. Otherwise, the default is, is now all, all, all virtual. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, um, we, we felt that bariatric and metabolic surgery should resume and should not just be, be left you know, in, in some corner. Uh, and because um, sometimes our patients are not given priority. We made a number of recommendations. Of course, these recommendations need to be scientifically examined in, in, in adequate studies, but I, I hope that that pandemic does not last that long that we have to examine these recommendations. I hope we get out of this pandemic soon, the vaccine and, and then the life can, can come back to normal. With this, I'm coming to the end. I would like to once again acknowledge all my co-authors without whose help this would not be possible and I would not be able to, to deliver this talk today. Thank you very much for hearing me. Uh, it's an honor to be amongst you. If I have, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kamal. There was a, a beautiful presentation and great study and a very time demanding one. So, uh, Probably due to time constraint, we are not going to invite any question here. And we haven't yet one and no comment also, but uh, I will uh, go for the next speaker. Uh, and I can see uh, Dr. Parsak who was not able to come. Uh, so I will uh, request Dr. Yalab, uh, probably from the same department is, uh, will present on the minimal invasive surgical management of digestive system cancers during COVID-19, which is a very, very time demanding topic. And you know, all are struggling during this period. Please, Dr. Yalav, uh, start your presentation. You will have 12 minutes to finish. And yes, Mahid, you have anything to say? Yes, uh, let, me, let me explain something. Professor uh, Parsak uh, shouldn't come because uh, one of our colleagues, uh, he's actually the executive board member of Turkish Surgical Society, Professor Alabas is struggling with COVID-19 and he is now being uh, went, uh, intubated and connected to the ventilator. So Jam actually couldn't leave him. So he's uh -huh. in the ICU with him now. That's why Orchun is an associate professor from the same department. He's going to present okay. his talk. Okay, okay. I'm so, so sorry to hear that, but we will continue with Dr. Yalav uh, for the presentation. Okay, thank you, Yalav. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, I'm really sorry for unexpected situation that uh, Dr. Osman uh, explained the situation very well. We are really so sad. And I would like, to, I will try to give this presentation as much as possible. Uh, Turn your video on. Are you going to put the video on? Yalla. Um, I have no video. It's just presentation, but uh, I'll start video first. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, an unexpected room. Uh, I supposed to be at the hospital, but we're on the station because of the station. Share screen. You you go to the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay right now? Yeah. Fine. Perfect. Okay. And, and uh, this is the situation. Uh, uh, that uh, still we don't know so many uh, so many information about this disease about this pandemic so i just took that uh, um, slide from one of my colleagues published in his uh, paper i just found it so so suitable in that situation Yalav, can you can you go for slide slide show because oh sorry
Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah, okay. it's fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry again. Yeah, no problem. So as we know, this disease is increasing all over the world, and then uh, death rates from uh, death rates are different from countries to countries. But m mostly it's, um, said that the healthcare pro professionals are being infected. So to do our uh, minimal invasive surgeries, I guess we we should understand the situation and uh, we should uh, give answers to do that questions, and then uh, we need to discuss uh, with our colleagues and uh, balance the situation to do that surgery or not to do surgery according to those um, questions. And we know from uh, previous data that when you, uh, um, the tumor is not showing the same behavior, like some tumors, we, if you wait too long between the diagnosis and treatments, then you uh, are causing the worst uh, survey. So we should keep in mind. And uh, on the other hand, and if you postpone the cancer surgery because of the COVID-19, and then uh, then we need yeah, uh, we need a certain amount of time to treat all the cancer patients when we when we go back to the normal life if this pandemic uh, ended. So I'll say like one size fits no one is suitable for cancer management during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We have to uh, be careful about what patient that we choose for surgery, what patient we should uh, delay the surgery. And this all will be uh, according to uh, in per patient's comorbidities, disease severity, regional pandemic burden and hospital research. So as we know, the cancer is really uh, fragile, often monitored and immune systems uh, uh, compromised by cancer itself and by oncologic treatments. So it is causing the worst survival during COVID-19 pandemic. This might help us. Um, I thought uh, this uh, classification uh, from uh, uh, SAGES. So we need to understand our health system or hospital system. If, in this, uh, if the, uh, our health system in the phase zero and phase one, then we can continue to that surgery like we do before, but we should be definitely careful. But if uh, the situation is uh, phase two and three, then we should, we, we should be really careful to choose which, which patient, cancer patient needs treatment firstly than other. So I understood the uh, contamination agents uh, from the previous studies and then uh, some suggestions came from the West. Uh, they offer like stop elective surgery. Also they prefer laparotomy over laparoscopy, but these had a low quality of evidence. The biggest concern was the surgical smoke created by the surgery because we know that well, we know from previous studies that it, uh, it has um, a virus that it can harm uh, healthcare professionals. But to, uh, to do our minimal invasive surgery, maybe we should focus on how uh, or which way terribly we can get this virus in the OR. Uh, I, I'm sorry I missed the first presentation, but I don't want to talk about this much. But uh, uh, according to papers that this surgery no matter open or uh, minimal invasive surgery, it should be in a negative pressure environment in the OR. And then the intubation and extubation period is the, uh, has the higher risk for the healthcare professionals. So we should be really careful uh, while the anesthetists are uh, doing those uh, procedures and they should be all under uh, personal protection equipment. So, uh, the question is that the smoke that created uh, between laparoscopy and laparotomy is the difference. Um, no significant difference is particle created th those type of surgeries. So this can uh, give us chance to do our surgery uh, as a minimal invasive surgery. And then that surgical smoke and aerosol contain um, SARS-CoV-2. These the information we know from the previous data and then these are the particle size can uh, find in the uh, smokes. It is possible to capture this COVID-19 from the smoke, but not uh, data showed us, no data showed us that there is this virus in the smoke. Uh, so if you use the proper evacuation system, uh, is it gonna help us to you know, make the laparoscopy safer than laparotomy? Uh, so many 
published, uh, papers published about this. And yes, we should be really careful and choose the closed evacuation system, which is like ULPA, HEPA, or AERSIL. I know these are expensive, but we should uh, consider not, we should not think about the uh, economy or money uh, at that situation right now. So what do we know about the tissue extraction during minimal invasive surgery? Uh, we don't know actually anything. We don't know uh, much information about this right now from the uh, data. So after all, uh, recommendation from east to west, uh, one by one uh, relief on the literature. First uh, came from China. And then uh, secondly, Dr. Sabir uh, released this uh, article and then the sages uh, from the West that uh, they uh, declare uh, their uh, guidelines. So again, we should definitely uh, look at this balance and uh, we should choose uh, which patient, cancer patient needs uh, surgery first. And uh, definitely we should all be, and our, our staff, we should all wear um, personal uh, protection equipment, but we should keep in mind that SARS-CoV-2 uh, size is uh, smaller than this all. So that's why we offered to put extra surgical mask over N95 mask in the OR. And uh, we should definitely be show maximum attention at the beginning because we don't know any leakage uh, from the pneuma peritoneum will uh, affect the OR uh, staff and uh, anesthesialists, uh, including us. So we, the recommendation is that if you use the closed technique it will be better than open technique when you do your minimal invasive surgery. And uh, if it's possible, we should use disabled trocars instead of visible uh, trocars because uh, visible trocars may contain a virus load after uh, cleaning. And uh, like, uh, like as we know uh, that we should definitely close the port incision, uh, uh, which is like higher, ten, higher than 10 millimeters. But right now we should close all the port incision, no matter uh, what size are they because of the uh, gas leakage. And uh, again, previous data uh, showed us that high pressure uh, into uh, abdomen and uh, high flow rates and then uh, long procedure time uh, are increasing the rates of the isola uh, isolation. And then again, from the previous data, like port side recurrence in the cancer patients. So that's why uh, the, the guidelines offer us to use low flow with a low intraperitoneal pressure and uh, minimize your surgery time as uh, possible. And the smoke evacu uh, evacuators, uh, as, you, as you see from the slides that uh, uh, there are some other different companies, their production uh, on the screen. If you can, if you have uh, air seal, which is better because we know the COVID, uh, we know the SARS-CoV-2 uh, size. But if we don't have them, uh, then because of the economy or some other reason that we can definitely use this low cost safe effective method. Like you need to uh, put that filter between your trocar and then you need to use your aspirate, uh, aspirator system. Uh, so you can create your own closed evacuator system uh, as I said, which is low cost and safe. And then uh, we, while we're uh, ending the surgery, we should put show max, uh, we should put maximum attention to details like uh, electrocautery uh, setting should be the, at this set at the lowest. And if it's possible, we should not use those um, instrumental because they produce much aerosol and uh, all the pneuma peritoneum should be safely evacuated. Uh, then after we make sure that all pneuma peritoneum should be uh, safely evacuated, then we should remove all the trockers uh, that we insert at the beginning of the surgery. Could you please finish in one minute? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, last few things to say, like we should uh, Put, uh, we should be really careful in the OR because uh, we don't wanna uh, injure our uh, personal uh, protect equipment. And uh, we should not use drain, surgical drain, if it's not necessary. And uh, we should definitely teach and practice safe surgery to our team as Dr. Saber uh, mentioned in his paper. 
because uh, your team will make you, uh, will lead you to do your uh, dream works. And the dream works at the COVID-19 right now, we should uh, not harm the patient, we should not harm the OR staff, not the surgical team, and not the environment in the OR. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Yalav, for your beautiful presentation. And I will ask uh, Mahit to wrap up the session, but before that, I really want to thank all the speakers for their excellent presentation. It's a very time demanding session. And I, I also remember our colleagues, you know, in Bangladesh, we have lost more than 120 doctors, and which is and including a quite a good number of senior surgeons too. So it is a, it is a, a very sad thing for us. So uh, uh, the safety, to maintain the safety in the operation room, uh, for everybody, starting from surgeons to all assistants, is of utmost importance. And that's what we really found from all the speakers' thought and presentation. And I also hope that your colleague, Mahir and Yalav, uh, who just been intubated a few minutes ago, hope he will get well soon, inshallah. But anyway, uh, we'll have to go with this COVID for a while. And we have to be really, really careful to save ourselves actually to serve the people or serve the patient. Thank you, Mahir. I hand over the microphone Thank to you. you to wrap up the session. Thank, Thank you. you. And I have to say that we lost 53 uh, doctors in Turkey and over 29,000 healthcare workers are actually affected by COVID-19. And I believe the number will be increased However, I have to say that we have to carry on doing surgery and I would like to ask the speakers uh, and uh, I know that they also uh, believe uh, to do a laparoscopic surgery during COVID-19 as well. Asim, shall we carry on doing laparoscopic surgery? By all means, certainly. You take all the correct measures. Uh, I, I see, I mean, if you just look at Ivan Lewis or McEwen's esophagectomy, the uh, respiratory complications come down from 27% all the way down into single digits with laparoscopy. Um, open surgery also produces flu, so does laparoscopic, which means we just need to get better at handling that plume and not um, saying that, oh, we won't do one just because it creates this problem, but we can solve that problem. So yes, thanks. Kemal, shall we carry on bariatric surgery as you resume on your uh, uh, presentation? Uh, unmute yourself, Kamal. So, yeah, sorry, guys. Um, so it's, it's a good question, Mahir, and, and my take would be that it, the decision has to be local. And if the surgeon feels comfortable, depending on the local transmission rates, then yes, go ahead. For example, we have been doing it for 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 last two months now, and and we've been okay. And I know from other units in the UK that that they are delivering safety as well. But UK has, has now come to a low stage of the pandemic. You know, we were quite bad in March and April and May, but we are okay at the moment. And if things get worse again, then I would say again, you know, don't, you know, put it on hold and, and don't perform bariatric surgery. So it depends. The local decision should be local. For us, it's okay for now. Okay. And Orchard, shall we carry on doing uh, cancer surgery uh, at this situation? Otherwise, I mean, if we cancel the operation for that kind of patient, uh, they will come back to us with uh, a later stage of the disease. So what do you think? Um, you're 100% right about it. That's why right now from my hospital that I work, that we should we, uh, stop all the elective surgery. We just do the cancer surgery. But we are so picky about which patient that we should give this uh, treatment firstly than others. So as, a, as all the other says, like it's, a, it's about your lo uh, local hospital's situation and the area. So yeah, we should do that surgery on our cancer patients. Okay, then I would like to uh, thank everyone uh, for joining us for this uh, fantastic uh, virtual Congress and hope to see you again in the next uh, meetings. And uh, I will leave the microphone to Sardar to say something, and then uh, we will say bye to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mahir. And, and I again thank all the speakers, and, and, and especially Asim as one of the organizers. And I really congratulate you for this ELSA 2020 uh, virtual congress. 
it's a it's everybody a great, used to be congratulated everybody yeah, yeah it, is a, it is a great great achievement from, from the elsa organizers and of course all of elsa thank you very much thank you very much so we'll have thank you uh, thank uh, you everybody bye bye have a good day thank you bye, bye. Thank have you. a good day okay yeah stay safe stay well bye.